Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the November monthly Extension Dairy webinar series. I am Kim Clark, your host for today. I am a, the Extension Dairy Educator here in Nebraska. Uh, I am pleased to have our guest speaker today, Kirby Krogstad. Um, before we get started, I do want to recognize our sponsors that we have for this webinar series the Nebraska Corn Board, the Nebraska State Dairy Association, Ball Camp, DCC Waterbeds, and Automated Dairy Systems. So thank you to our sponsors for their support. It is greatly appreciated. Also as a reminder, um, any information and content from today's webinar series cannot be used without the presentate, without the authorization of the host and presenter. So, um, reach out to Kirby or myself if there is any information or materials that you would like to use for today. Um, so I've known Kirby for a few years. Kirby um, is a former master's student at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. He graduated in August with his master's of science degree, uh, studied under Dr. Paul Kahnenoff. And now Kirby is a PhD student at Michigan State uh, studying under Dr. Barry Bradford. And today, Kirby will be talking about the effects of pelleting feeds on digestibility and dairy cow performance. Uh, pelleting is often done because it improves feed handling and transportation conditions by increasing feed density and decreasing feed shrink, both of which reduce feed costs for producers. Beyond these logistic advantages, recent experiments have ingested the effects of pelleting feeds on digestibility and animal performance for dairy cattle. Evidence suggests that pelleting feed may enhance fiber digestibility, which may increase the value of the feed. And this presentation will review the pelleting process, explore experiments evaluating pelleting effects on feed and effects of feeding the meal versus pelleted feeds. Uh, for those participants, um, type any questions that you have in the chat, and Kirby will address those at the end of the presentation. Um, and given our audience today, um, I will also allow everyone the opportunity to unmute themselves after the presentation. So thank you, Kirby, for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Kim. I was um, excited to get a chance to do this, and it's even though it's... Uh, not in-person human interaction. I need as much of it as I can get. So thank you for that. Um, so yeah, uh, with that introduction, I suppose we can get started. I'm going to try to stay brief around, around the 30 minute mark. So if I get a little windy, you'll have to let me know. It's been known to happen. But like Kim said, I'm gonna talk about pelleting feeds and then we'll get into some digestibility data on dairy cows. But just to start this presentation with some of the take home points that I hope you get from this is that pelleting and the conditions used can influence digestibility of feeds. And then feeding the pellet versus the meal inc increases ruminal, and the key word there is ruminal, starch, NDF, and crude protein degradability. The reason that the ruminal part of that is important is because starch and crude protein digestibility may increase in the rumen, but total track the data is not as consistent. So it's, it's really important. It's about the site of digestion of some of the data that I'll be reviewing. And then also um, when we get to the end, we'll see that one challenge when feeding a pelleted feed, especially a palatable one like distiller's grains, which I'll talk about, is that you can see some feed sorting. So like Kim said, I'm currently a PhD student with Dr. Barry Bradford here at Michigan State. I'm gonna, going to be studying dairy cow nutrition, immunology, and doing some data analysis projects. I completed my MS in Lincoln and uh, really centered my projects around NDF digestibility, in particular, looking at pelleted DDGS and uh, some forage feeding strategies. <coughs> so today I'm gonna briefly go over why we pellet feed. We'll touch on the pelleting process, but not at any great length. Um, I'm really going to focus on these two points here. We're going to go over the effects on feed digestion, site of digestion, type of feeds, and then a little bit of pellet quality, and also the effects of feeding a meal versus a pelleted feed to dairy cows. And then we'll close with some take-home points and ideas 
and hopefully a little discussion if anybody has any questions. So to begin, we pellet feed largely because of logistic advantages. Um, there's a lot of feed handling things that, that really make it an, um, advantageous. You have less dust. Um, if you are familiar with the term bridging, if feed sits in a bin as a mash or a meal form, it'll set up and almost harden and it's hard to get it to flow out of anything. So that can be a problem if you're shipping something long distance or storing it for a long time in a bin and hoping it'll flow out. Pelleting will help take care of those problems. <clears throat> and also pelleting will increase feed density. Um, so you can get more onto a truck. Uh, if you're pelleting an entire ration, one benefit of that would be um, no feed segregation or inability to sort feed, but we really don't see that in ruminant systems. That's mostly a monogastric chicken and pig kind of decision, but nonetheless a possible advantage. And like you'll see here, it can reduce shrink. I think of this, especially when we're storing feed in windy places, or if you're storing feed in a pile and you don't have access to a, a bunker or a building where you can store some of these um, mash style feeds. And then also if you have range cattle and are feeding in a pasture or feeding in an exposed area, um, having a, a mash versus a meal, a mash feed will be able to blow away much easier than a, than a pellet feed would. So the last advantage I'm not going to touch on today, but one that I want to make sure I mention is that you also have the destruction of anti-nutritional factors that could help with digestion or animal health in some cases, but I'm not going to dive into that today. So just to get started, I want to talk about some of the possible implications of the feed shrink piece before we get going. So this is some data adopted from these two sources listed at the bottom. And you'll see they project distillers grains shrink to be 15 to 22% in an open uncovered pile. So just a pile sitting out on the ground. That level drops to 10% if you have a three-sided bay and even less if you put it in a closed tank. So I just wanted to think about that and look at the cost of that feed shrink. And it's really important because the, the added cost of the shrink of the feed is substantial. And I'm going to talk about DDGS towards the end of this because that's the study I conducted in Lincoln. But if we look at distillers grains at $160 a ton, if you store it in an open pile, shrink makes the actual cost of that feed $184 to $195 a ton, depending on how much shrink you observe. So that's that's a $25 or $30 a ton difference. And if we extrapolate that to a thousand cow dairy feeding five pounds of distillers grains in the diet. That's a cost of twenty-two to $32,000 a year in just feed shrink. So one thing I want people to think about when they're <clears throat> talking about uh, pelleting and pelleting feeds, shrink is part of that. And pelleting a feed will raise the cost, but the money you may save on the shrink component is, is substantial. Um, I don't have great literature data on this to give you exactly how much shrink is reduced from feeding a pellet but I think that's an area we could do some work to find out what the cost benefit, benefit of that is. But nonetheless, the shrink component is fairly large here. So just to briefly touch on the pelleting process, uh, simply it's, it's these four steps. You grind up your feed, whatever it may be, to get to a uniform particle size. You put that feed through a conditioner. So you condition the feed and all that is is um, adding moisture and heat in the form of steam. And that softens the feed. It provides a little bit of lubrication when you're going to push it through the dye. And that moist heat also helps gelatinize the starch slightly, not dramatically, but slightly gelatinize the starch and also may help denature some of the proteins present. And I'll show you data later why that might be important. Then once the feed is conditioned, we'll push it through that pellet mill, through the dye. And those dye sizes can range from 5 30 seconds of an inch up to three quarter of an inch where you'd have less of a pellet and more of what they call a range cube. Um, so you'll see a range of sizes, but then once it gets pushed through the pelleter, it's cooled off and stored or sold or whatever the case may be. Um, and along these steps, especially conditioning, you can have different conditioning times, different conditioning temperatures, and you can also have different pelleting um, speeds or die sizes like I mentioned, all of which can affect the pellet quality. And the main way we measure pellet quality is through the pellet durability index. And the pellet durability index is a simple measure. All it is, as you see in this quote, is a percentage of pellets that remain intact after being submitted to some kind of mechanical force. There's different ways to 
test this. There's different mechanical forces that can be used, um, but generally submitting it, some kind of tumbling or hitting it with something um, and then measuring how much of that pellet held together. So if this video goes off without a hitch, I'll be, I'll be shocked if it does, but you'll see, hopefully you can all see this video playing and you just have a tumbler. And in that tumbler, you'll see in a moment is there's paddles in there and those paddles are gonna be what's hitting that feed, submitting the feed to the mechanical force. He's gonna open it and you'll see what it looks like. And basically all you would do is put feed in there, tumble it for a while, dump it out, measure how much stayed in a pellet, measure how much fell apart, and the percent that stayed in a pellet is the PDI index. So basically PDI, higher is better. It's a harder pellet, it stays together. And there's actually a little bit of data that says a higher or harder pellet um, improves animal performance, likely to some of that dust containment and um, less feed segregation. So briefly, I'll touch on what does it take to make a good hard pellet? Um, there are feed manufacturing experts that would know the ins and outs of this. I just wanted to hit a couple of big ticket items. The first one is fat. Too much fat in a feed or a feed mix reduces the pellet durability index. And that's just because like in so many industrial applications, fat is a lubricant. and It'll just help that feed slide through the pellet die without being compacted. And <clears throat> that doesn't make for a very hard pellet because the compaction is what brings it all together. Another thing is it can be a barrier to steam penetration and that um, would limit any effects on the nutrients like the starch and the protein I mentioned earlier. And as I said, a few times we'll talk about distiller's grains. This is historically one of the reasons it was a challenge to pellet DDGS is you had a product that was high in fat, 10, 11, 12, 13%. So you really would have a hard time making a nice hard pellet with a feed like that. Um, generally a non-starch feed makes a harder pellet than a starch feed, but if you have to have starch, there's some sources that say pre-gelatinizing the starch and then pelleting it um, is harder, makes for a harder pellet than naive or native starch. And then incorporating crude protein seems to also increase the PDI, but that's not cut and dry. There's a few other pieces to that. So really the formulation of your feed mix, if you're doing a mixed pellet should be taken into consideration. So briefly, we hit on the pellet process. It's just grinding, conditioning, pelleting, cooling. Um, <coughs> we talked about some of the nutrients that make a good pellet, but I really wanna spend time talking about how that affects digestion. And so as you'll see, crude protein digestion seems to shift towards the rumen, which surprised me as I read through the literature, and starch is gelatinized slight, slightly, which increases digestibility. The total tract digestion though is similar across across pelleting or not pelleting. It's really about the site of digestion. So when I was in high school and undergrad and studying animal science, you always kind of have the thought that heating a feed is bad. Dark color, poor digestibility, it's no good. And this has historically been a problem for the distillers, grains, and ethanol industry because early versions of distillers would often come out with a darker color. It doesn't look as good. It may be a little less palatable, um, but then the distillers industry really dealt with a, a bad rap for that of having poor digestible feed, which really isn't the case if you look across different protein feeds that are similar to distiller's grains. But generally you'd say heating a feed is bad. And that can be right because you can get the formation of these malleard products, which occurs when you denature a protein, you unfold and peel apart the structure, you stick in some of these sugars and you get covalent bonds that reform as you heat it that forms this complex that's indigestible. So that is a problem, but it's important to remember those occur at very extreme temperatures in excess of 180 degrees Celsius. In pelleting, we only see 80 to 90 degrees Celsius. So that temperature is important to consider when thinking about feed processing. And also heating is a method used to protect proteins and ruminant. So you have heat treated soybean meal. But again, heat treated soybean meal is treated in the 150 to 180 degrees Celsius range not the 80 degrees Celsius range of pelleting. And this is some data from a project in the Journal of Dairy Science in 2015, just to demonstrate this, you have a raw soybean meal where the RUP content is about 25%. When we add 149 degrees Celsius of heat in extrusion, it goes up to 40% RUP. So we're shifting crude protein digestion from the rumen 
to the intestine. When we add high heat or 171 degrees Celsius, we increase that drastically up to 60% RUP. So not all heat um, increases or more heat at extreme levels of this 150 to 171 degrees Celsius will shift the digestion of protein past the rumen, um, especially in the soybean meal. Heat treated soybean meal is a common feed that's used, but pelleting is a much, much lower temperature, much more moderate temperature. And this data shows that RUP does not increase from pelleting feed. So instead of shifting protein digestion out of the rumen, pelleting actually might shift it into the rumen. And that's because that moderate temperature, that 80 degrees Celsius might be just enough to denature the protein a little bit, open up the structure of the protein to allow microbes access to it and chew it up. Um, but this, this data is not super clear and consistent, but there's some indications that may be what's happening. So in here, you'll see I have RDP on this axis, which is the rumen degradable protein and the type of feed processing. So you have an untreated feed, expanded, which was at 115 degrees Celsius, toasted, which is 132, and pelleted feed, which was at 80. So <clears throat> what's important here to think about, I think, is the temperature and then moisture. Toasting doesn't add any moisture. Expanding and pelleting, I believe, add a little bit of moisture. Um, but what you'll see here is the untreated versus the toasted and expanded. Expanded increase RDP a little bit, but when you um, account for the standard error, you see it's pretty comparable. But the pelleting increased the amount of rumen degradable protein drastically from 38-ish percent to greater than 60. So clearly I think pelleting may be doing something to the protein structure of these feeds that's allowing for more rumen digestion. And it's important to note that this study used a mix of legume seeds um, and legumes may be affected differently than a starchy cereal grain. Uh, this is rumen degradable starch, just to demonstrate the pelleting may also alter starch digestibility. So you can see the untreated version of the feed versus the pelleted version. We drastically increase rumen degradable starch. This study also measured the amount of starch that was gelatinized. And that's just the amount of starch that basically has water invade, pushes the starch molecules apart and allows more microbes access. And you saw a slight increase in the amount of starch gelatinization, but total tract starch digestion, very, very similar. And that's because once starch leaves the rumen, it can still be digested in the hind gut um, and it really can catch up so the total tract starch digestion not affected. So to review that data we just went through, starch, you have the greater gelatinization of the starch, so you're pushing apart those amylose molecules, allowing more digestion, but total tract digestibility very similar. Protein, like I said, this surprised me personally, but there may be a shift from RUP to RDP at the moderate temperatures used in pelleting, so that 80 degrees Celsius. Um, but again, the total tract digestion of the protein was fairly similar. So it's not about changing the whole digestibility, but shifting the site, I think. Um, but the interesting thing is that effect may be dependent on the feed stuff. Because different types of proteins have different temperatures of denaturation. Um, and that's a, a feed chemistry term, and, and it's one I'm not super innately familiar with, but it can affect how proteins break down with heat application. So this displays some of that. So you'll see in this case, they pelleted barley, corn, oats, and wheat. And when they pelleted these cereal grains, they slightly reduced RDP, which is contrary to what we saw in the last slide. So that's what I meant when I said this data is not necessarily cut and dry. It might depend on the feed. It depends on the protein that's present. Um, so I think it's really important for feed manufacturers to understand and investigate some of these differences across feed class and feed type. But you'll see RDP was reduced. In this study, indigestible protein was reduced. So you actually had more total digested protein after pelleting. Um, they did also do an expander treatment. As we would expect, expanding drastically reduced RDP, that more severe temperature. You had more RUP because you're pushing that digestibility out of the rumen. And also rumen starch digestion increased for corn and sorghum, but not for wheat and oats due to pelleting. Um, that's mostly because corn and sorghum are not as digestible forms of starch as oats and wheat. So a little bit of gelatinization in those types of um, starch would have a greater chance to increase rumen digestibility.
but I want to show data particular to DDGS because that's what we're going to talk about later. And this is some unpublished information out of Kansas State, but they show that the pelleting process increased the amount of RDP in the feed. So you'll see again, we have RDP here with the unprocessed feed and the pelleted feed. So we go from about 58% rumen degradable up to 65% or 70% rumen degradable protein after you pellet the distiller's grains. And they found the same thing with dry matter with more rumen degradable dry matter after pelleting. So I think it's, it's interesting to see that this increase in RDP is a response that's been shown in a couple of different sources and some high protein feeds. Um, this was, I believe, a mixed pellet feed. So it's, um, I can't say it was all distiller's grains, but this is a fairly clear response, about 10 unit increase. So also, would this have nutritional consequences? Does it change how we have to think about certain feeds if they're pelleted or not? It's important to think about those things. <clears throat> so briefly, I'm going to talk about some of the conditions and how they may affect digestibility as we've been talking about. Um, in 2015, uh, a group out of Canada, I believe, did an experiment where they changed the conditioning time and temperature. And I'm going to show you the effect of time here. So we have zero seconds conditioning, 50 seconds conditioning, and 75. And what they found, you'll see dry matter in the gray and crude protein in the green. As we increase conditioning time, we increased rumen degradable um, or rumen digestibility of those nutrients. Uh, dry matter was a slight increase and crude protein was an increase. So at that moderate temperature of pelleting, longer time maybe allow that protein to denature and open up a little bit, more microbial access, more feed degradation in the rumen. But again, total track digestibility in this experiment was similar. I do want to point out, I don't have this data displayed, but when they increase the heat of conditioning, they increase the amount of RUP. So that again demonstrates that the moderate heating of pelleting around that 80, 90 degrees Celsius doesn't, doesn't do much to increase RUP. But if we go above that, we'll start to see protein denature to the point that it reforms covalent bonds and might shift to digestion to the hind gut. So it's important to look at the temperature that's used in these processes. So in the beginning, on my first slide, I mentioned NDF digestibility, and that's kind of a big part of what my thesis was, but I haven't mentioned it yet with, in regards to pelleting. And this is the first time I'm going to show this, but it was one of the first bits of information that showed me pelleting may also have a role to play in NDF degradation. So again, we have conditioning time, zero seconds, 50 seconds, or 75, and rumen degradable NDF. And you'll see we increase rumen degradable NDF the longer they conditioned that canola meal. So this is a little bit more evidence to me that shows maybe there's something going on with the fiber portion of the feed in addition to the protein and starch. So to recap, <clears throat> pelleting shifts crude protein digestion to the rumen, maybe. It depends on the feed class. It depends on the temperature of the pelleting, the time conditioning. But generally, I would I feel fairly confident saying we get more RDP after pelleting a high protein feed. We get a slight increase in NDF digestibility, maybe. I only showed you one data point on that. I'm going to show you more in a moment to hopefully convince you that we do. And then a slight increase in rumen dry matter digestibility. But if any of you are like my dad, who um, was a dairyman for 30 years, you'd say, well, that's just a lab analysis. What does that do? You know, tell me what the animals said. What did the cattle say? So that's what I want to show you next. Um, most of the data in pelleting, like I mentioned before, is in monogastrics. Um, they pellet more often. It's something that, you know, in a large swine or poultry facility, they'll have a pelleter on site. So there's a lot of data within the monogastric and in pigs in particular, it's consistent response. If you feed a pelleted versus a meal, you get an increase in digestibility and feed efficiency. In this study, about 7%. In this study, I believe it was about 5%. And here, um, depending on the nutrient, it was a 1% to 5% increase in digestibility and a slight increase in feed efficiency. What I found interesting, and I don't display it here, but the higher pellet quality, so the less fines in the pellet, the less kind of, um, the less junk that falls off the pellet during processing, you know, so a higher PDI led to better animal performance. So it's not just that digestibility may be improved, but some of the physical quality of a good hard pellet um, was beneficial to monogastrics, in this case, pigs and chickens. So something to consider that that pellet quality also matters when we're feeding livestock. 
Uh, there's also a lot of calf literature on pelleted feeds. Um, feed processing is used quite quite widely of texturized, pelletized, rolled, all kinds of different feed processing used. I mean, in, a couple, in a, one particular study, they found that a pellet feed for calves was comparable to texturized starters um, in terms of average daily gain and intake. But also, as I mentioned before, they also demonstrated that increasing conditioning time during the pelleting process increased digestibility by about 4%, increased the amount of gelatinized starch by about 50%, and increase the PDI of the pellet, which as I mentioned, the PDI may also be a part of the animal performance or also improve animal performance. <clears throat> this is just a graph displaying that increase in digestibility as we increase conditioning time. So you have zero minutes, two minutes, and four minutes of conditioning time. And the red line is dry matter digestibility. So you'll see it increases slightly as we move left to right. And the same response can be seen with NDF and starch. So you'll see that the longer conditioning time increased PDI and digestibility. So maybe beneficial when feeding livestock. So now this is when I wanna really get to where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, and talk about some lactating dairy cow data. And there's two projects that are in the literature that I am gonna focus on. One is from the Journal of Dairy Science, this group Tosta et al 2019. They fed oats as 15% of the diet dry matter and these were fed to Holstein cows about 65 pounds a day of dry matter intake. Um, the other thing I want to note is that they fed 53% forage. The second experiment I'll discuss is what I did during my master's in Lincoln. Um, you can go download my thesis here at this link, but distillers is fed at 15% of the diet dry matter. But these were Jersey cows eating about 44 pounds of dry matter. And finally, one other wrinkle we tested in this study, which um, Paul's actually going to address in next month's webinar, is looking at forage feeding strategies. We wanted to look at lower forage inclusions. This isn't a dramatically low forage, 45%, um, but we want to expand the amount of data in that space. There's sort of a, a resurgence in that area of research looking at low forage formulation strategies. So that's something I'll touch on very quickly as we move through the end of this data. But the first experiment I'm going to show you some information from is the Tosta et al. study where they fed four types of oats. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, they fed, um, sorry, three types of oats. So we have rolled oats, flaked oats, as you'll see here in this green line, pelleted oats, or they had a barley control. On this graph, we have the pH of the rumen and the hours post-feeding. And the reason I wanted to start with this is I think some of feeding studies with, with rumen pH data like this, it's always a, a Looking at the pH curve, it's always a good way to get a picture of the fermentation, of the health of the animal, um, just to get an idea of if that diet was, was working or not. And the reason I wanted to show this is that pelleting doesn't really, doesn't drastically alter the fermentation in the rumen. For a couple of time points, there was differences in rumen pH, but across the day, you'll see a p-value of 0.63. So um, pelleting clearly doesn't drastically alter or pelleting oats in this case, didn't drastically alter the rumen environment or the rumen pH. You're not worried about acidosis or anything like that. But when we look at some of their other data, they saw that feeding the pelleted oats increased dry matter intake by four pounds. So I got excited by that. Well, what did it do to performance? Did you get the bump in production? Well, energy corrected milk was similar across treatments. And what I found interesting in this study is that they witnessed this increase in total track NDF digestibility when fed pelleted oats. So I have pelleted oats here in the green in the middle, flaked oats on the left and rolled oats on the right. Feeding pelleted oats in the TMR, we had a roughly three or four unit increase above flaking and, um, or sorry, a two to three unit increase above flaking and a nearly seven unit increase above that of rolling the oats. So I think there's something going on with pelleting and fiber digestibility. The one part of this study I can't quite wrap my hands or wrap my head around yet is when they fed the pelleted oats, they saw a big reduction in the milk fat. They went from 4.1% milk fat to 3.8. Um, as I showed, I showed you the pH data on the previous slide. I'm not, um, the rumen was healthy, so I'm, I really don't know where this reduction in the milk fat was coming from. But I think for transparency, it's important to mention that they did observe that with the pelleted oats. So as I mentioned in that last study, the pelleted oats increased fiber digestibility. We have a little bit of evidence from some previous studies in calves and pigs that we have increased digestibility when pelleting. 
So what about feeding a pellet dis pelleted distiller's grains? So what we'll see is NDF digestibility slightly increased, but cows also sorted. And really, we looked at that forage concentration question, and there wasn't much of an interaction on some of our major variables. But I'm going to show you that data next here. As we have, <clears throat> first I want to show the meal distillers and the pelleted distillers side by side, just to give you an idea of what we're looking at. So the dry matter was nearly identical, crude protein nearly identical, NDF was identical. The two measures I want to point out to you are this 30 hour digestible fiber number. So this data came from an in vitro lab analysis. Put the feed in with some ruined fluid, ferment it for 30 hours and measure how much feed was digested. Well, the pelleted distillers had a slight, slight increase in digestible NDF. Um, for those of you that may be a little more familiar with looking at some of this data, the standard deviation is large. So in a statistical jargon sense, it's not significant, but with all of our other data I've showed you, there's always a tendency in the direction of increasing NDF digestibility. So I think there's something going on here. But another indication is that lignin decreased when pelleting distillers grains. And that's important because lignin is the most significant factor limiting the availability of plant cell wall material. So for decreasing lignin, we're likely increasing access to the fiber. So both of those indicate increased fiber digestion is possible with the pelleting. So here's the diets we fed. We had low forage and high forage treatments, as I mentioned. So the low forage were about 45% dry matter. High forage were about 55. High forage also had a little bit of wheat straw thrown in to try to slow down passage rate. That was one of our goals of this study was to evaluate passage rate because in Nebraska and South Dakota, we've had a couple of rough years of growing forages with the amount of flooding and other logistical challenges of putting up quality and quantity. Hence, so we wanted to just look at how lower forage diets affect that passage rate and if high fire forage diets drastically reduce it. Um, in the chemical composition, the diets again were really quite similar except for one item I want to touch on, which is the 30 hour NDF digestibility number again. And we'll see that low forage diets have more digestible fiber than high forage diets. And that's because the forage fiber was replaced with non forage fiber like beet pulp and soybean hulls, which are rapidly digested in the rumen. So that's something to consider if we're balancing diets that are lower in forage. So as I mentioned, we wanted to look at passage rate. And we'll see here on this graph, I switched back to my scarlet colors instead of using the Michigan green and white. But as you'll see, the red boxes are meal distillers, the gray boxes are pellet, and the dotted line for a border is the high forage, the solid line is the low forage. And you'll see the low forage diets, we had higher passage rate than the high forage. So that was exactly what we hypothesized, increased forage, reduced passage rate. So what about rumen pH? Did that longer residence time do anything to rumen pH? Did increasing forage or pelleting DDGS do anything? Well, what we'll see here is that the form of the distiller's grains um, did not affect the rumen pH and rumen environment, but forage concentration did which is an expected result. If we increase forage concentration, we increase rumen pH. So these dotted lines are the high forage treatments, and you'll see a slight increase in the rumen pH throughout the day compared to the low forage treatments. But I do wanna note, um, the difference wasn't drastic enough where I'd be worried about um, rumen acidosis or animal health issues between these two treatments, but it's an important consideration when we're balancing diets, especially in a low forage situation, to make sure to maintain rumen pH. So digestibility was really our question though, is does feeding this pellet or the high forage, low forage treatments affect digestibility? And what we're gonna see is NDF and energy digestibility increased as a result of pelleting the distillers. On the left, we have NDF and on the right, we have energy. And as you'll see with going from meal to the pellet, we have a slight increase in NDF digestibility in both the low forage and high forage treatments that increase in digestibility translated to more digestible energy in those diets as well. So um, our data couple that with the one from the oats study and couple that with some of the in vitro data we have. And I think you have a picture that shows you can improve NDF digestibility through feed pelleting. But again, got to get down to where the rubber meets the road. Did it change production? Now this was a very small study, only seven cows, 
in a crossover design. So um, we really weren't looking at these performance animal production metrics. We were really looking at the rumen data more. So I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock in this, but energy corrected mil milk was similar across treatments. So that first of all tells me that low forage and high forage rations can achieve similar performance. But we did see a little interaction on protein. On the high forage diet, meal distillers grains led to a lower protein con or protein yield than high, uh, pelleted distillers grains. Uh, the more I thought about that, I thought maybe pelleting increased fiber digestion, maybe more pro microbial protein, maybe more milk protein. Um, but that's uh, it's a weak connection from this data, so I don't want to lead you astray. But we did see that response. We're not entirely sure why, but that is one possibility. And then finally, I mentioned sorting on the first slide. We looked at sorting in our study. The way to read these graphs here is um, if the bar is within, or if the bar is near zero, no sorting occurred. If it's above that, sorting occurred for that sieve. And if it's below that, sorting occurred against that particle size. So the way we did this was using a Penn State particle separator box. We shook out the original diets and then we shook out the refusals and measured the difference between each layer of that particle size or um, each layer of the Penn State box. And um, the top layer, the 19 millimeter layer of the box, no differences in sorting across those. But the eight millimeter and 1.18 millimeter, we observed what would consider like a sorting behavior. So with the pellet, animals seem to prefer the eight millimeter particles with a greater propensity. And with the pellet, they seem to sort against the 1.18 millimeter particles. So I think what could be happening, there's two things that could be happening. One, cows could be more easily able to find the distiller's grains. They go pick it out because distillers is known to be a palatable feed. Cows like it, they'll go find it much easier in a pellet versus a meal form. Or if that pellet crumbles throughout the day, we may be getting some artificial values here. It's hard to really tell. But it's possible and reasonable to think that if we're pelleting a palatable feed like a distiller's grains or a soybean meal um, or something that is that we know cows like to eat, sorting is going to be a challenge. So we've got to think about that and consider it when um, feeding pellets in our rations. So what I want you to remember or take home is that the slight heating of um, pelleting, that 80, 90 degrees Celsius, may increase RDP and NDF digestion. We also showed improved digestibility in animal studies along with that lab data, but performance doesn't necessarily follow suit. So it's important to consider that when you're talking about factoring in the increased cost of those pellets. Um, but I think we could stand to have a little more data in that area. Um, pelleting does increase the cost of a feed. I found a number from a review paper in 2011 where they say at least 4%. Um, so I think that's important to consider that when, when marketing your feeds. And also factor in the feed shrink costs that I showed at the beginning and um, pricing when you're pricing pelleted feeds. You've got shrink reduction and improved digestibility possibly when feeding pellets. So think about those things if you're marketing in these type of ingredients. So I just want to thank Poet Nutrition for the partial funding of the project I showed you we conducted in Lincoln and for some funding during my master's at UNL. Um, especially Dr. Herrick, who was a mentor of mine throughout my master's and an internship I had with Poet Nutrition. Um, and I'd also like to thank the grad students that I worked with, especially these two. This is Kyle McLean. He graduated with me and he's now in Wisconsin working for Vita Plus. And Cassidy Boos is getting her PhD currently with Dr. Kononoff in Lincoln. So I just want to thank those people along with Dr. Logan Morris and um, Chad Jenkins, who also helped throughout my study along with Addison Carroll was currently a student with Paul as well. So with that, I will take any questions or conversation that anybody may have. Uh, my email is listed there if you have any questions. Um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Kirby. Great information to share. Um, everyone should have the ability to unmute yourselves. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to go ahead and unmute and we'll have Kirby uh, address your questions. Oh, Maristella, it looks like you're muted. Hello there. Now, 
Yes. There you are. Hi, Maristella. Hey, Kirby. Congratulations. I really enjoyed and I learned a lot. Well, good. I'm glad. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, I have just, uh, you know, it's, it's just curiosity because I don't know. Um, one is that uh, you mentioned about a lot about the digestibility. What about rumination? So or it's, it's going to affect rumination and, for example, feeding behavior, or it's going to depend on the amount of pelleting that you use or not? Um, yeah, so actually that we did have or gather that information and um, we're currently trying to publish. So okay. it, all of the data will be in the manuscript. But what okay. we saw is that pelleting didn't change rumination or chewing, but mm -hmm. it did change, um, or I shouldn't say it didn't change rumination, but it changed total eating time. So what we think happened is cows were spending more time playing in the bunk. They're spending more time trying to sift through the feed, um, but rumination time wasn't affected. Forage did increase rumination time as we would have expected. Um, mm -hmm. There was also one experiment I was gonna mention that did a TMR where they pelleted the whole TMR. Um, they saw a drastic reduction in eating time and uh, chewing and rumination. So I wouldn't advise doing a whole pelleted feed like that for dairy cattle because that would have some, you know, repercussions for the rumen. Okay, nice. And then one thing that, uh, um, a lot of curiosity, because you mentioned about the cost benefits, and then in one of your tables, you mentioned about uh, 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 that you had an increase, and in, I think it was in the high forage of almost two pounds of milk, I think that it was. Uh, yes, so there was a two and pound. And for the high yeah, so do you think that that is going to correct that cost benefit? Um, I think it, I think it could. Um, I, I like I, I tried to look at this production table with a lot of caution because we just had such small numbers. Um, and these were all rumen cannulated. So that's another part of the picture. So I'd like to do a study where we could do a very similar layout with a pellet and a meal feed and feed it to 40 or 50 cows or 60 cows instead of seven um, and see if we do get a response in milk and then do a nice economic analysis of the cost of pelleting and the improvement in performance and the reduction in shrink because that's the only way to get a really good picture and I don't think we have enough information on that to get a good picture from this data. Okay, okay interesting. One last thing, I don't want to get a, a lot of time here of you guys. So um, uh, years ago, when I was in Spain, we worked a lot with waste uh, food, you know, mm -hmm. because uh, what, uh, you know, what do we predict that's going to happen in 2050, that we need to find, uh, you know, a source of, uh, to feed animals. So, uh, and one thing that we are working, it was um, with waste from, from, you know, from, I mean, us, you know, I mean, from the supermarket, et cetera. And I was working with a milk replacer and the powder. And then when you were talking, I was thinking that could be an option to add to the pellets as well. You know, mm -hmm. uh, products from, you know, uh, from waste that uh, if you offer to the animal, they will not eat. Could be because of, you know, palatability or, you know, other things. So you think that that would be also an option for pelleting? Yeah, I, I do. And um, that's actually a an area of research interest of mine is some sustainability bits with that. Um, I think Dr. Bradford did a really cool study in Kansas with feeding um, like community waste from a grocery store, mm -hmm. coffee ground, brewer's grains from a brewery. Um, so I think that would be an excellent opportunity is taking that community waste, pelleting it into a feed for cattle. Um, I think that that could be a great opportunity. And I would love to look at like the the carbon footprint and some of the exactly. yep. and all of that, I think it'd be really cool. So I agree. I think that'd be excellent. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for your questions. Mm -hmm. Great questions, Maristella. Are there any other questions for Kirby? All right, well, hearing none and seeing none, thank you everyone for your time today. As a reminder, our next monthly webinar series is December 8th at 11 a.m. And Dr. Paul Kononoff will address uh, feeding 
lactating dairy cattle with low quality and low quantity forages. So um, just kind of a big expansion for some of what Kirby touched on today. So we look forward to seeing everyone next month. Thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Bye.